Vegas Video Network Studios, just steps from the Las Vegas Strip, it's Top of the Food Chain! And now your host, he's one part mohawk, two parts attitude, and a touch of what the f***, it's Al Mancini! Thank you, thank you. Welcome to Top of the Food Chain. I am your host, Al Mancini, coming to you 15 minutes late today. Scott, we're late. I'm late. I gotta call the doc. I gotta get one of those pregnancy tests. I don't like to be late. Um, yeah, sorry about that, folks, if you were sitting around waiting. Um, but we are here. Blame it on me, because it's usually my fault. Anyway, you're at Top of the Food Chain on the Vegas Video Network, your home of all things Las Vegas. Plenty of television or webcast shows you can watch here. Watch them on your Roku. Watch them on the VegasVideoNetwork.com, iTunes, YouTube, you find them everywhere. And we cover just about every subject, drinking, golfing, sports betting, real estate. Just look it all up at VegasVideoNetwork.com. We've got a lot of cool stuff going on. Anyway, if you are watching Top of the Food Chain today live, get in the chat room. We're going to be doing, um, doing a couple things with you today. We're going to talk about French bistros, give you a little bit of an intro to what they actually are. And then we're going to give out some um, Thanksgiving cooking tips, because Thanksgiving's just two weeks out right now. Thanksgiving's one of those times where you all feel like you've got to cook a big dinner and impress your family, and half of you don't know what the hell you're doing. At least I know that was what it was like for me the first few times. So we've got an expert here, an expert chef, a good friend of mine, and he will be just throwing out a couple helpful hints to make Thanksgiving dinner impressive. So when you've got to impress the family, it will do just that. So get in the chat room with any Thanksgiving questions right now. If you have a question for a future show, email it to me at food at vegasvideonetwork.com. And that's easy enough to remember, food at vegasvideonetwork.com. I forgot to mention, every Friday night, all of the Vegas Video Network shows most of the Vegas Video Network shows stream live, not live, excuse me, stream um, back to back, a big solid block of programming on the radio, KSHP AM. So take advantage of the fact that you have an AM radio. You probably don't use it that often. And use it on Friday nights and check out, check out all our programming on KSHP 1400 AM. And if you have a question, if you're listening and you want to dial something in for a future show, the number there is 866-966-4599. God, I think I've said just about everything, plugged just about everything there is to plug. Um, so with that in mind, we will get the show started, and we will talk to Scott. Scott, how are you? Hey, um, I'm looking at the uh, Channel 1 shop there, and I see something shiny and red. Shiny and red. Oh, yes. Well, it has been a, um, it has been a busy day for me today. I've been running around like crazy. The best thing is, I got the fir very first off the plane, first copy of Eating in Las, Ve Eating Las Vegas 2012. Very Eating nice. Las Vegas, the 50 essential restaurants, the 2012 edition. Updated from last year. We changed the color, but we changed a lot of the graphics inside. I can't show you what's in there just yet. Oh, come Scott. on, Al. I cannot tell you what's the in there. The scoop. What's on page 14? It is very secretive. Page 14, 14. baby. Page 14. Oh, that would be um, the name of a restaurant that I think... Several people I know will be going to very shortly, but I can't tell you which one. Was it on last year? It was. It was last year. I'd say of the 50 restaurants in this book, probably about 40 of them were in there last year. Mm. Um, but we, you know, and that, that's going to happen because you've got great restaurants, and they're not going anywhere. You know, most of them are staying good. We had to make room for about 10 new restaurants. Um, a couple of restaurants closed down. We had to make a little bit of room. Um, we had to take some of our favorites and kind of either push them. Somebody decided to veto them to make room or we just kind of let them disappear altogether. Not because we don't like them, but we just don't see them as the 50 essential in this changing landscape. Did, the, any, uh, did any new restaurants, like within the last year, opened restaurants, did they make your list? Yeah, uh, several restaurants that have opened in the last year made the list. I mean, you know, keep in mind, Cosmopolitan wasn't even open when the first book was put to print. So, of course, there are going to be some contenders that we were considering over there. Um, a lot of local restaurants that have, that have opened in the last year. Um, so yeah, there's, there's several new, new restaurants. The interesting thing is we actually have one restaurant that's opened in the last year that made our top 10 this year. Um, and the top 10's really had a little bit of a shakeup because you don't expect those super great restaurants to really change that much from year to year. But right. we've got a brand new restaurant that made the top 10. We've got another restaurant that was in the 50 last year that inched its way into the top 10. And we have another one that 
that was around last year. It's been around for several years, and last year we didn't even want to put it in the top 50, and this year it's actually made the top 10. Mm. So all will be revealed at a party at Guy Savoie on Monday. Uh -huh. And so, I mean, hopefully, Scott, you're going to join us at that one. It's going to be a blast. I will be there with my fancy palette. <laughs> Don't know. Yes, and well, you Not get to see your old buddy Franck Savoie. <laughs> yes, I love Franck. And, and his lovely wife, Lee, both of whom have been guests on this show. A lovely gal. Yes, she is indeed. I still have her jacket that she left here. I was say, do we <laughs> gonna, get her jacket back to her? Gonna, I'm going to wear it. Just tell her we sold it on eBay. <laughs> yeah, we sold it on eBay, Lee. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, yeah, it's been a crazy day. I had to pick up the book, um, trying to keep everything under wraps, but I needed to see it myself. And then also, Scott, I had to go do a news story about people getting married for 11 11 11. Oh, that sounds pleasant. Yeah, you should see the line today down at the, um, the county clerk's office, the marriage license. They were giving out about two licenses a minute when I was down there this afternoon. Really? Yeah, they're expecting this definitely will surpass Valentine's Day for weddings, um, probably surpass last year when it was 10, 10, 10. I think the only day that if it comes in second to anything, it'll be 7, 7, 0, 7. That was the really big one. But... A lot of people really into getting married so they have a cool anniversary day. Didn't you say somebody had, had said that they wanted to get married on 11, 11, 11 at 11 a.m.? Yeah, one of, the, one of the couples that I spoke to had actually booked the 11 a.m. slot, and I think they booked it back in March for whatever wedding chapel they were doing. Thinking ahead. So, I mean, it's crazy. And then I met other people who just decided two days ago, Nice. what the hell, let's get married, it's 11, 11. They'll have as much chance of staying married a year from now as anybody else. Yeah, I, I, I wish them well. I just hope they make it to their first anniversary so they can appreciate it. It could be 11, 11, 11, 1. Yeah. Well, that was the most, um, you know, the most popular reason amongst women as to why they want to get married on 11, 11 is so that their idiot husbands will not be able to forget their anniversaries. I resemble that. Yes. Well, Scott, um, unless you've got something to chat about, anything cool going on in your life? Nothing. Okay. My life is miserable. It is all work, all work and no play for Scott. Um, okay, well, we're going to um, get to our guest in just a second, but first this message. Traditional media believes that after about three minutes, you'll tune out. Most Vegas media companies think if it doesn't jiggle, you won't tune in. At the Vegas Video Network, we think both are wrong. The Vegas Video Network is the first and only live online broadcast network that specializes in insider news and expert views about Vegas. We combine great storytelling with the ability to watch when and where you want on your computer, mobile device, or television. Discover the real Las Vegas. Visit VegasVideoNetwork.com. And we're back on top of the food chain. I, once again, am your host, Al Mancini. What? And with me today, I've got a good friend, Mr. Brian Howard. Brian, how are you? Pleasure to have me here. It is a pleasure for you to be had, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> thanks for coming. I've known Brian for a long time. Um, God, where did we first, where were you working when we first met? Uh, I want to say Cat House. Cat House? Yeah. yeah, you opened up Cat House. Yep. Carrie, Carrie Simon, of course, was a consultant there, but you kind of were in there day to day, yeah, opening it up absolutely. when Carrie wasn't there. Yep. And um, then you moved over to um, New Sanctuary? Yeah, after that I went over to New Sanctuary first and yeah, opened that up. And now you are at Kamsa in the yep. Cosmopolitan. Yeah, Kamsa. And Kamsa, of course, one of these restaurants, like so many in town, where it's known for its celebrity chef. And David Myers, great guy, wonderful. I always great chef, good mentor. Town. Great chef. But, you know, what people don't realize a lot of times is these celebrity chefs, they come in as often as they can, but they've got places all around the world. And... The man doing the nuts and bolts of everything over at Kamsa is you. Yeah, yeah. I have a good amount of uh, menu development and uh, pretty much 90% of the menu now, and he's given me the run with it and you know, trusted in me that I can do the job, so we're doing it. And that's what you really have to respect about a lot of these chefs in, in this town is they give their executive chefs the freedom to really run with the restaurant. You know, and they, you know, so many other chefs I know who are, who are very similar that way. You know, Michael Mina comes to mind, um, but David obviously you know, says, yeah, you may have to prepare one or two of his signature dishes, but he wants you to bring your food to the table, right? Yeah, yeah as long as it's within guidelines of the concept and what we're doing. Um, you know, he gets on me every now and then. I'm a big uh, fan of Japanese food, so, you know, we'll sneak some Japanese ingredients every now and then. And, <laughs> He gets wind of it and gives me a call. He gets into me, but, you know. Says, what the hell are you doing? Nah. He calls me Suzuki. Every <laughs> All right, Suzuki, calm it down. <laughs> nice. And then he comes and he eats it and he says, okay, put yeah. it back because yeah. it was good. You got to keep it open for, you know, future endeavors, you know. Right. Let them know what you're about. 
Well, I wanted to talk about two things today. Um, you know, we did a show on French dining in the past, but it was mostly about fine French dining. We mentioned, not that, there's, not that what you do is not fine, don't get me wrong, what you do is quite fine, but um, you run a bistro, yep. a French bistro, and we mentioned what a bistro was then, but we didn't really get into it. Could you kind of explain the, the basic concept of French bistro? Because a lot of people hear the word French, and they, they think scared. it's yep. going to be guise and there are going to be you know, crazy things they've never heard of before, and a bistro is exactly the opposite. Absolutely. Um, I think what people misunderstand about, well, even bistros, I mean, there's different brasserie bistros. Bistros yeah, get were, a uh, we're a brasserie, you know, and uh, bistros essentially are places that are small and fast, and sometimes it's a verbal menu or written on a chalkboard, but simple comfort food, you know, uh, the classics, cocovan and cassoulets and those things that were done back in the 18th century. I mean, I think when bistros originated, 1864, right around there. Uh, brasseries are a little more upscale. And brasseries yeah. are traditionally, though, attached to a brew house, right? Well, it, it, the term is brewery because okay. uh, they were, you know, with brasseries and bistros, I mean, it was all about the trade and the, the travel, you know, back then in uh, a place where people could share food, uh, a gathering place. You know, so you had all these uh, people in the regime time that were traveling through Lyon and they'd stop off at a, you know, small bouchon and they'd, they'd have this pate with them, you know, and they'd introduce these people to this pate and it became a staple. You know, and uh, so as the settlers and people moved on, all these kind of menu items became, you know, traditional for a bistro or brasserie. Uh, so, yeah, bistro actually means quickly, right? Yes. And that's because well, people it's a Russian. So it's a Russian soldiers, and I think it was uh, during the wars, they were bistra, bistra, which means hurry. Right. They wanted it fast and quick. Right. You know, but, I mean, things have evolved, you know. Uh, and so now then... A a brasserie serves similar food to a bistro. Absolutely. Traditionally, it's attached to a brewery. Mm -hmm. You are not attached to a brewery. No, we're not brewing our own beers yet. So what makes you more of a brasserie than a bistro? Well, uh, I think on the uh, brasserie always has a written menu, and uh, bistros do not. You know, bistros can be written on a daily basis, which we are tasting menus is written and changed on a daily basis. But um, brasserie is uh, a wide selection of food. I mean, it can be pasta, it could be pizza. I mean, you go in the central cities of Paris, and I mean, you're going to see pizza on the menu. Uh, of really? course, tart flambés, I mean, things like that. But uh, and pasta, you think is Italian? You know, it's it's basically, like I said, the gathering place, a loud, bustling place where you can enjoy great food, get together with your friends, and have a selection of everything from a great hamburger to um, you know, some great duck pate or some seared foie gras. Okay. You also mentioned a bouchon. Mm -hmm. Of course, people know a restaurant known as Bouchon here right. because uh, Thomas Keller and yep. his brother are both big fans of the bouchons mm -hmm. in, in France. As I understand it, a bouchon is sort of a bistro type restaurant, but from certain areas That's, of France? It's uh, from Lyon, originated right. in Lyon. And again, that was, you know, like I explained, through the traveling and the food and the staples got originated in those places. Um, and the thing. In traditional bouchons, I understand they would always have a zinc bar. Yep, always have a zinc bar, and I think there's only 27, like, and there's, a, and a, there's a rating system for them that you can actually get classified to be a bouchon, but I think there's 27 of them in the world. Really? Yeah. Well, and, you know, there, we have some zinc bars here in mm -hmm. the States and here in Las Vegas, and I don't know how they got through customs, because as I understood it, there's like lead content <laughs> yeah, problems, and lead in there. there was a lot of either sending it back to have it redone, or maybe sneaking it through on a boat, I don't know, but you know, it's, it's pretty hard to do that here. In, in yeah, Vegas. I mean, well, sometimes as a chef, you gotta do what you gotta do to get your product. Right. You, know? yeah. <laughs> you guys have your own little black market out there. Yeah. So if somebody's gonna go to a bistro, a brasserie, or a bouchon, and most of them, I guess, based on your definition, most of what we see, here in town are going to be the brasseries by that yeah. definition yeah. without I mean, the brew pub attached. Right, right. I mean, uh, you have Mon Ami Gabi, um, Bouchon. You know, they're they're all great. Pinot Brasserie, right. and very similar guidelines. I think that Comsa we're setting a trend for a new wave, uh, something that you'll see more in New York or in France. Um, kind of that cross of modern meets classic. Uh, you know. Daniel Baloud, for example, you know, you have uh, DBGC and uh, his um, Daniel Baloud Brasserie in New York. They're a lot more modern, DB modern, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so what are you going to expect to see in these restaurants that people should know? I mean, like I always use Steak Free is probably the 
perfect the classic, bistro, the yeah. classic bistro food or the you know brasserie food. And people go, steak free. And you know, I don't know, if you're afraid of the French, you don't realize that all it is French fries is steak, French yeah. fries and a steak, and usually a, a thin hanger steak. Mm -hmm. Over at Mon Ami Gabi, I think they have 11 different varieties. Yeah, they do. Their menu is quite extensive. Yeah. Um, our menu is not as extensive as that because of the techniques that we use. But I mean, the thing that about bistronomy, if you will, or uh, this new way of bistros coming into America, and what we're trying to do and set the pace for is that you're going to see um, that the same techniques you're going to find in Elaine de Casa in Monaco or, you know, in all these fine dining restaurants, but in a casual atmosphere. Uh, the same quality of ingredients and the same uh, refinement and plating skills, but we do it on a larger scale for the masses, you know. Right. And, I mean, of course, a lot more approachable to the everyday guest. Right. You know. So to, I want to give people a couple words just that they should think about. Again, steak for eats, seriously, you're not going to go wrong. You don't, you're not going to feel like you're in a French restaurant. You're right, going to right. be all American, usually um, shoestring style French fries yeah. is what you'll get, and a steak, and then moules frites. Moules frites, uh, yeah. mussels, and white wine, and I mean, there's a couple different, uh, you know, dishes created around the mussels, but but yeah. the mussels with the French fries and the white wine, I'm telling you, people, y you want to talk, just taking the the French fries and sopping Dipping up it right the juice, into broth, and, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's better than any bread, you know, to eat the, eat that kind of. Um, that sauce with, you know, it's really, the French have it on the Italians when it comes to sucking up that sauce from I the agree. mussels. I agree, I <laughs> agree. Any other classics? What, you, you mentioned a cassoulet. Yeah. Now, yeah. people here, cassoulet, again, they get a little afraid. You know, and that's the thing, especially in Vegas, I mean, we're so uh, oversaturated with great restaurants and the, the demographic of the people that are coming into town are, uh, it's so versatile. So, I mean, we've toned down, and I think a lot of restaurants have toned down the verbiage, in a sense, of the French verbiage to um, accommodate to the everyday people. But um, cassoulet, I mean, it's like your mother's goulash, or essentially, but using beans. You know, nice bean stew with uh, duck or sausage in there and tomato base and breadcrumbs and baked. I mean, it's a real simple dish, real hearty, comforting. Uh, it warms the heart, warms the soul, you know. And then another thing that you'll find a lot of in these, these casual French restaurants, and we've done a show on this in the past with a good friend of both of ours, Gino Bernardo, yeah. And that would be charcuterie. Yeah. yeah. Or, and of course, he'll call it salumi because mm -hmm. he's Italian. But charcuterie, salumi, basically cured meats. Yep. And you are one of the pioneers right now in doing your own charcuterie in the yeah, restaurant. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'd like to say I'm, I'm putting out the best right now. And uh, you know, there's some great stuff out there, but I'd be willing to challenge people to it. I've I'm, I'm got it dialed in. You know, and it's taking some work. Uh, it's definitely uh, a process that you have to have the respect and love for the product in order to achieve the greatness to it. You know, people love prosciutto. They love, you know, a uh, good salsi son or salami, you know. Uh, we're just doing it in-house, you know. Yeah, and you can taste it that it's being done in-house, you know. Yeah. I mean, you cut down your own pigs and you, mm -hmm. you process them and you cure them and you stuff them in whatever you gotta yeah. stuff them yeah. in to make them that shape and you hang them up somewhere in your fridge, I guess, and you, you put the, the mold on the outside and you really just let it age and you're, yeah. you're yeah. monitoring it the whole time, right? Absolutely. And yet people think that's weird, but they'll go to their supermarket. Some of you guys out there would never order charcuterie, but you go to your supermarket and you order salami or pepperoni. That's the thing. My, is... my younger brother is the, the great example of that. You know, I gave him a slice of a nice uh, soprasada that we made. I'm not eating that. You know, what do you mean you're not eating that? You like salami, right? Yeah, but I like the hard salami. Well, it's the same thing. Right. <laughs> you know, just a different flavoring to it. And, yeah. So what do you do in your restaurant to kind of try to keep people from being afraid of the, of the words? Well, like I said, we've gone to a lot more uh, Americanized verbiage. Uh, it's understandable. Mussels and fries, you know, mussels frites, or you know, I think actually the mussels frites are still in there, but, um, you know, duck confit is not a uh, confit de canard no more. You know, right. it's, it's duck confit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, uh, you know, I mean, I think we taking a simple approach to the food uh, and that's understandable for everybody, but uh, it may not be when they get the dish. You know, it might be something that's completely um, different to them. They might not have recognized this before, but when they eat it, it takes them back to a, maybe a childhood memory or even to a new place. You know, is there a particular? You talked about how you're using. You spoke about how you're using modern techniques. You know, the, the fine dining techniques on the casual food. Is there one or two dishes that you would recommend? First, one in your restaurant, absolutely, and then anybody else that you that you really enjoy, if you happen to have one, who's really taking the traditional food and putting a nice modern spin on it? Um, well, as far as the dishes go, what we're doing here, um, well, I mean, I think it all comes down to technique. 
You know, uh, most brasseries, it's about three simple ingredients, a good glazed piece of meat, a great cooked vegetable, you know, and a good starch, uh, and a great sauce, you know, and uh, in this case, we're taking many techniques, you know, and uh, like our duck breast, for instance, I mean, we have, I think there's 12 different cuts of vegetables and types of vegetable on that plate, I mean, they're all small, but they're all done in their own unique way. I mean, one's cooked in a red wine butter, one's glazed in honey and uh, veal stock, you know, I mean, they each have their own significant thing to them. And then the cooking process of the duck, I mean, it's cooked sous vide, you know, under, under low temperature in a water bath, you know. Um, you know, I think when you get into doing 300 to 600 covers on a daily basis, you know, those kinds of things, they can be challenging for a chef, you know, that you're not in a 60 seat fine dining room, you know, but we do it and we do it well. Cool. Well, we're going to be right back. We're going to move from France to classic Americana, which is Thanksgiving. Um, and I'm going to ask for some of your advice on Thanksgiving cooking. Absolutely. But again, we got one more quick message, and we will, we will be back. No pressure. Hi, I'm... <laughs> Hi, I'm Dennis Silvers from... Can't think of the name of my damn show. Golf and other four-letter words, and you're watching the Vegas Video Network, I think. And we're back on top of the food chain. I'm your host, Al Mancini, and I have with me Brian Howard from Come Sa here in Las Vegas at the Cosmopolitan Hotel and Casino. We just spoke a little bit about brasserie and bistro food, French stuff, which is scary to some of you out there, I know, but now hopefully it won't be. But I want to get to all American cuisine right now, and I want to talk, because I'm going to be off for the next couple of weeks leading into Thanksgiving, um, taking a little hiatus, so this is my last show before Thanksgiving. And I want to talk about Thanksgiving cooking, because as I said at the top of the show, it's one of those meals where everyone thinks they can do Thanksgiving. And, and pretty much anyone can take a turkey and shove it in an oven. The first time I cooked a turkey, oh, I have to tell this story. The first time I cooked a turkey for Thanksgiving, I hear this. it was great. Um, my wife and I were living in New Jersey outside of Manhattan. And um, so we tossed the turkey in the oven. And we went into Manhattan, and we met some friends. And the turkey's cooking three, four hours. And I say to somebody, yeah, oh, the, cookie, the turkey's cooking at home in New Jersey. And they're like, oh my God, you have to get back there. I'm like, why? It takes four or five hours. What's the big deal? And they said, you've got to baste it. And I said, my wife and I, we weren't married yet. We had just moved in together, first apartment. I said, baste it? What do you mean baste it? I don't even know what basting is. And they said to me, well, you've you got to take the juice that gets in the bottom of the, um, the turkey pan. Mm -hmm. I said, turkey pan? What do you mean a turkey pan? And they're like, what did you put the turkey on in the oven? And we had actually just put it on a cookie sheet oh, in no. the oven and oh, no. gone away for several hours. Could have lit your so, house on fire. Yeah, we could have burned down the house. And we come running home, and we can just see it's almost like precipitating. There's like rain forming <laughs> on the inside of it. The, there's smoke and precipitation forming on the windows. And we look up, and we run upstairs, and the whole house just reeks of turkey. So... Um, so we put it in a bigger pan and we basted it and then we went out again because right. we, we went to pick up my friend's girlfriend at a strip club nearby where she was working. And the weird thing is the strippers who were dancing for us from, they told, the us, turkey, they told they? us that we smelled like turkey. <laughs> yes, so we smelled like Thanksgiving. So we brought a little Thanksgiving to the strippers of New Jersey nice. that holiday nice. by way of them rubbing up against me. And that made me feel good. <laughs> But seriously, okay, that, I'm, I'm assuming if you're watching this show, you're not as dumb as I was back then. And that was a good 20 years ago, 25 years ago. But um, I'm assuming you're not that dumb. But the truth of the matter is everyone thinks they can make a nice Thanksgiving dinner. But there are tiny little secrets that some people don't know. You know, you, yeah, anybody can open a can of corn and shove a turkey mm -hmm. and learn to baste it, of course. But there, there are tips. And yeah, I want to talk about a few because I've spoken to a lot of chefs and they always tell me, you know, every year when I interview them, brining a turkey is key. Well, I, uh, I mean, you can, and I always used to brine my turkey. Um, I do not no more. I actually inject it. I find that you have a better skin, and I, I'm a big fan of, like, baking duck and hard cracked, crispy skin. Mm -hmm. If you want to achieve that, the brine really takes away from that. So what we do now... Um, well, can we explain what brining is absolutely, and how it's done absolutely. first? So, yeah. I mean, a, a brine is essentially to create juicy, tender meat in your turkey or your chickens or whatever you're doing. So it's basically a solution of salt and, uh, you know, for instance, I do um, salt with water and some honey and some uh, fresh herbs like thyme and garlic and, uh, you know, whole lemons in there. And we soak them in there for eight to ten hours roughly, you know, really absorbs that and you get nice flavor and nice juicy. So juicy. you soak the entire turkey in this In the solution, yeah. Solution. I mean, it, it's, it's basically uh, you're dummy proofing your turkey. 
I okay. Mean, well, a lot like, of us need to dummy proof yeah, things because uh, a lot of us are you, dummies. When you buy uh, your chicken, sometimes from the store, if you're not getting a you know cage free or organic chicken, they're they're just shooting it with a saline solution. Mm -hmm. That's their brine. You know, right. it's just salt water essentially. You know, okay. uh, but it breaks down all the protein and you know uh, really makes that meat tender and uh, flavorful. Okay, so again, guys like Wolfgang Puck have told me you must brine a chicken, mm -hmm. you must brine your turkey. But he's not American. You are, so right. you say there's some, there's a better way than brining. I, well, it. I've al always brined up until about a year ago, a year ago, and um, you know we started playing around with different ways to do it to achieve a really crispy skin, uh, and we found that you know trussing. I mean, that was another important thing that you've always learned from a, a French chef. Trust your chickens, trust your birds, so that it cooks evenly. Which well, is when you sew it up, kind of. Well, when you uh, you you'll buy your uh, birds from the store, and they'll come with a little bit of twine wrapped around them. Right. And get them all nice and tied up. Um, well, I find that it, it doesn't work that way. I mean, you want it to. The the Chinese have the best way. Peking duck. They hang it and they let the legs and everything hang there, and it cooks a lot more evenly. Um, so, anyways. What we're doing, we're, you know, you can buy um, a basic injector at the Albertsons or one of your local grocery stores, you know, and uh, make your solution. Um, and I can provide a recipe if you'd like. You can Absolutely. put it up. Um, but your salt solution with your uh, aromatics in there and inject it into the breast and into the legs. Uh, but you're not actually uh, affecting the skin at all at that point. And then what we do, we air dry it in the refrigerator. Um, and that basically dries out any excess moisture on the outside. And then we take our finger and separate the skin from the, the actual meat to allow airflow, okay? And then we actually hang it in the oven. Um, you can use a coat hanger if you want at home. I mean, we want to talk dummy proof. Uh, right. uh, and hang it in your oven with a drip pan underneath it and let that air circulate all the way around it. You're really going to get a nice hard crack. Why, that's how you cook it. You yeah. cook it yeah. rather than sticking it in the, in in your, the pan. In your pan and uh, hang it so it's uh, air flowing all the way around it, and then you baste it with what the drippings are coming. So the um, okay, so the basic solution that you start with would consist of what? Um, we're looking at water, um, salt, uh, honey for your sweetness, some citrus such as lemons or limes, uh, fresh bay leaves, thyme, and some garlic, and black okay. peppercorns. So you mix up that solution, and then you're talking about an injector. I, I have no kitchen utensils. I right. like to cook, but I do it so rarely I usually end up just, you know, makeshift You'd look utensils. like a guy that would have some needles laying around the house. I'm just yeah. saying. <laughs> yeah. well, I was going to say, because could I use these needles to shoot up afterwards? Or, you know, have the nice um, holiday buzz, you yeah. know? No, um, so these things, I'm assuming, are larger than yeah, what, you, yeah, what, yeah. Some, what your junkie well, friends uh, might have out there. <laughs> <laughs> Can you borrow your junkie? It probably would take a I lot would rather shots, not. I, right? think, uh, <laughs> I think the one at the grocery store would do fine. But is it, How um, big is it? Is Are we talking about like, we're the talking, size of the one you know, that they, John Travolta had to stick into yeah, the Thurman's exactly, heart? Is it like that? Exactly. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, and you can get them at every grocery store during the holiday seasons. Um, bring that brine up to a boil. You know, you want to get all them flavors kind of going and developing into the pot and then chill it down until it's cold. You're not cooking your turkey uh, in the brine. And then uh, inject the solution into the meat, you know, um, real simple. Uh, cook the turkey, I would say, uh, on high, I would say uh, 400 degrees for about an hour. And then I drop it down real low, about 225 for another four hours or so until it reaches internal temperature of about... 140 so and pull it out and let it rest. I'm just trying to picture this turkey hanging. You're hanging it from its legs or what are you hanging? Nah, well, yeah, you're going to hang it from the, you know, the uh, front feet, you know, essentially. Right. And then uh, tie it up with some twine and you can, however you got to jimmy it in your oven. Right. I do a lot of crazy stuff. You, I mean, I've you probably have a much bigger oven than most people. I'm trying yeah, to figure yeah. if this would work. You know, I've got two ovens. But I'm, I'm just telling you the best way. The I mean, you can put it in a roasting pan, right. you know, and uh, do it the traditional way. Uh, that works as well. But I, I think as far as maximum flavor and achieving perfect crisp skin, inject it's the way to go. Okay, and yeah. we have a question from the chat room. Scott. Yeah, Nate wants to know, is there a brand of turkey that you recommend that you can find at the grocery store? Absolutely. Um, I think uh, Whole Foods carries great chicken and turkey. Uh, they use, uh, I think they use Mary's Chicken, which is in Northern California. And if you've ever have a chance to look at their, their website uh, and really see how they handle and raise their birds, it's a... Uh, it's quite impressive, you know. They let them roam free, you know. They're not caged up, and you know the way they eat and feed them. I mean, it's like them being in the wild. So, uh, Mary's, I, rep I uh, recommend that. 
I had somebody ask me um, on Facebook, because they knew I was going to be talking about this topic, and wanted to know if when you buy a kosher chicken, because of the fact it's I guess salt it's treated, treated with salt, yeah. whether that affects how you would brine it or not brine it at all. I think so, yeah. Um, you know, Obviously, anything that you put into salt is going to absorb it and pull out a lot of the moisture that it has inside. So um, I wouldn't recommend using the salt in the brine. You know, I mean, you can do everything else, uh, the honey, the lemon, and the herbs and stuff, and uh, you know, soak it up in that, and you're going to get the same flavor, you know, but without uh, excess salt. Okay. Again, um, Thanksgiving for dummies. I want to talk about stuffing. Stuffing is one of those things that everybody has a completely different, whereas almost everybody does their turkey the same, mm -hmm. nobody does their stuffings the same. Right, right. Um, you know, it's pretty much you get some bread, and then from there it's all up in the air. Nuts, yeah, yeah. fruits, whatever, yeah. dried fruits, fresh fruits, um, you know, meat, oysters, I mean, yeah, whatever you want. Can go in yeah, there, right? It's, it's uh, you know, we used to have a dish called Ghetto Supreme when I was growing up, <laughs> and it was kind of uh, you know pork and beans and whatever condiments were in the fridge. Uh, that was a family dish when I grew up. Okay. So, and you know, that's I guess kind of what stuffing, stuffing is. Stuffing is the same thing. And of uh, course, you prefer you have to cook it inside the bird, though, right? Uh, you don't have to. No. I mean, it's like, it's like making a bread pudding, cooking in a casserole dish. Yeah, you know, I think uh, cooking it inside the bird, you're uh, obtaining a lot of the juices from the bird, and it keeps it nice and moist. Uh, but you can achieve it without doing it inside the bird. It's also the easiest method. It's, it'll save you uh, some dishes to clean up afterwards. Now, um, getting back to your bird, when it's done, if you're using a thermometer, what temperature? Where do you check? I pull what? it uh, out at 140, and I like to go into the thighs. Okay. Yeah. You know, so it's the thickest part of it. Um, obviously, it's going to take a lot longer to cook than the breast. Okay. So 140 in the thighs. Yeah. Um, Scott, another question. Yeah, Bob wants to know, won't a turkey pan with a rack do the same thing as hanging the turkey? Um, well, like I said, you can cook it that way. Um, it's not going to achieve the same thing just because you're sitting on that rack and you're blocking that drip pan underneath is blocking all that air that's circulating around it. Okay. Um, you have, you were doing probably one of the more creative um, stuffings that I've seen, and I actually posted this recipe on my blog about a month oh, and a half yeah. ago. And we're going to throw the ingredients up here just so that people take nice. a look at these, because this is a foie gras stuffing, and for me, this is the ultimate like gourmet turkey. And it's kind of hard to read, but I mean, you, you run down sort of what's in there. I mean, um, well, with the foie gras stuffing, I'm using focaccia bread. That's, uh, I mean, it, you can get store bought with flavored with rosemary, adds a nice uh, kind of ingredient to it, aromatic. Uh, but we're doing roasted chest chestnuts in there and, uh, you know, crisp apples. Um, the foie gras we're rendering out adds a nice richness to it. Um, what else we got in there? Uh, apples and butter. I mean, it's, it's just loaded with ingredients. It's good stuff. And, you know, like I said, you were kind enough to allow me to post that recipe mm -hmm. on my website. I'm not sure if it's still up because we've been doing some redesigning, but it's okay with you. I will try to repost it at almancini.net. And, Scott, I don't know if you're able to post it at VegasVideoNetwork.com, but I'd love to share it with our viewers that way as well. Yeah, it's, we can put it on the, uh, the show notes, no problem. Yeah, you cool. get it up. It's also on my website, ShepReinhardt.com. You can get it there as well. Okay, great. Um, do we have another question, Scott? Uh, no, but I have one. Okay. <laughs> Uh, how about, I have to do push-ups when I make a mistake, and I just forgot to turn on my mic. And you know, we I'm, do the same thing with our cooks in the restaurant. I'm, in, <laughs> I'm into 20 push-ups in this frickin' show. <laughs> Killing me. All right. Uh, carving the turkey. Uh, for many men, that is the most terrifying experience ever. Can you have any tips on how to carve a turkey? Uh, relax and breathe. You know, uh, well, I'm already I mean, it's really I'm easy. I mean, when I'm doing <laughs> it. you know, it's not a bad way to do it. Uh, that drunk when he's doing the show half the time. So. <laughs> I normally see booze all over the table. Yeah, usually, you know, well, yes, if like, you wanted us to bring anything you know. out, you said no. We've got the whole bar right back there that's all set up. Uh, carving the turkey, you know, it's. Um, you know, simple. Start at the breast. You know, that's the best way for a man, man to do it, right? I was going to say that's yeah. sort of my, pretty much our philosophy towards most Start things. Start with the breast and work it. your way to the legs. <laughs> much um, to many ladies' dismay, but you know. <laughs> yeah. Start at the bottom of the breast and uh, slice off of there, then remove the legs and uh, get into the dark meat. You know. And, you know, I want to talk about mashed potatoes. All right. And honestly, I would advise people, I'm sure you've got a great recipe, yeah, but if yeah. anybody wants the most decadent mashed potatoes they've ever had in their life, you can disagree with me. Get right. Joel Robichon's cookbook uh, it's, it's and Mesa Robichon. I mean, we, I think most, uh, most chefs that know what they're doing, they're following the same guidelines. Which is yeah. just butter, butter, and more butter. Loaded, you know, it's uh, three to two potato to butter, so it's, you know, it's, it's so right there. So you've got two... Helpings of butter for every helping of yeah, potato. Yeah. We'll do um, 
roughly on a daily basis, we'll use about 15 pounds of butter just for potatoes. Wow. You know? And, you know, when you do eat the, I mean, seriously, people, when you do eat that kind of, again, if you get the Robichon cookbook or anybody else's, first of all, you add the butter slowly over time. Yeah, yeah. And um, but it is decadent. But you do have to understand, you can't do the heaping, you know, um, close encounters of the third kind, mashed potato, <laughs> you know, thing, man. I mean, a little dab will do you when yeah, you do yeah, that. And you'll be thrilled. You'll have maybe this much butter on your plate, but I mean, potato on your plate, but it'll be the greatest mashed potato. I think uh, potatoes are overthought, and, uh, you know, I think that, you know, it's real simple, and uh, people can make great potatoes at home with, uh, you know, buy a ricer from, you know, uh, one of the nice kitchen stores around town. Uh, William Sonoma, and get yourself a sieve. Two extra steps will give you the perfect smooth puree or potato puree with a little bit, you know, a nice added amount of butter. Right. Will go a long way. Cool. Well, look, I want to thank you so much for coming down, My Chef pleasure. Brian Howard, Kamsa at the Cosmopolitan. Excellent restaurant. Cool vibe too. It's um, designed by Adam Tahani. Yeah, yeah. And Adam has done so many restaurants in this town. Most of the time when you walk into an Adam Tahani restaurant, you kind of feel like almost intimidated. It's like you're working in, walking into a museum or a church. Right, right. When I walk in, I mean, you know, because he's done, well, I won't list him. People can look him up. But he's yeah. done these incredible yeah, he's done restaurants all over the all world. All over the world, and especially here in Las Vegas. He's done such a great casual vibe in your place with the chalkboard walls, and you just feel like you're in it's a It's inviting, group. you know. It's very inviting. You know, it's fun. Great little Paris, you know, hipster hangout is what the place feels like. When the weather's nice, you've got, I think, one of the best balconies because it looks straight down the strip, but you're only on the third floor, but you can see all the way down the strip. All so the way down the strip, and you got the Eiffel Tower right there. I mean, it yeah. just takes you to Paris, if you will. You've got pretty much yeah. everything. There's that Dan Bellagio sign blocking the fountains. <laughs> that they're annoying me yeah. with that one. But, but sometimes when you get the great view, you're up really high, but you also get the street scene because you're mm -hmm. only on the third floor, but you can see all the way down the strip. So please check out Kamsa. Um, incredible restaurant in the Cosmopolitan. And you got to get there down on your vegan day because I also do vegetarian tastings and full on vegan tastings. Really? As well. Yeah. Well, I will definitely have to get down there yeah. and check out your vegan food. It's always rough when I go to a friend's restaurant and I'm trying to be vegan though because, you know, Sorry. I want to eat everything great on the menu. Um, in the meantime, ladies and gentlemen, as I mentioned, I'm going to be taking, yeah, like there are any ladies or gentlemen in my audience. Um, <laughs> I'm going to be taking a three week hiatus. I have the book, Eating Las Vegas, coming out this next week. We've got a couple major parties to promote that. I'm going to be doing, if you miss me, because I'm not around, um, I, I will be doing, I think, TV appearance next Monday on Fox 5. That should be coming on right around 6 o'clock. I believe Guy Savoie may actually be on with me. So check out Fox 5's More Show in the afternoon next Monday. And also, I think Wednesday, I'm going to be on KXTE-FM, which is Extreme Radio with my buddies Dave and Mahoney. So I will be around, but next week, it's all about the book. And then we got Thanksgiving and a little vacation for me. Three-week hiatus. I will be back in December, and we will be getting crazier than ever and talking about more food than you could possibly eat in a lifetime. But we're going to try to convince you to do it. So thanks again. Follow me on Twitter, out, at Al Mancini Vegas. And my website, which is finally back up and working, is Al Mancini. Net. Anyway, Scott, thanks. Brian, thanks. Jacob, Thank thanks. You. And I'll be back in three weeks.